So welcome to part four of Lots Some of you may know there are only really three parts, but I had such a great time. Mm -hmm. Good. It's really great that Albert's come on board for the fourth and final. I, I say final, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, a fifth part, but that will be quite some time on because we've got um, other unrelated and Greg Borromeo. Um, so as I say, you can make sure your mic's off or I can mute all. But I don't want to <laughs> So I just want to thank you all very much for coming. Um, people who've been involved behind the scenes and our previous speaker. Um, and thank you very, very much for people like kept coming special. Help me. Um, we keep getting boys from Langer ringing our doorbell wanting bread. Um, and I appreciate people been donating over 19 courses of the by Art Project. So quickly, I um, want to tell you a bit more about Albert. Um, some of you may know from Art to Get to the way back. Um, Quite summary, um, and you also did it to uh, Freemason by Kate Um He qualified both the Princess Foundation grant. Um, he came back in 2020 and he worked for Sciota, a very successful practice that are known for their amazing. Residential houses and places like uh, um, he left there in March. And, uh, well, same time teaching at UCT. Um, just a quick recap on um, what we've done before. Um, great, some of you have joined us. If you haven't, do do watch it on the Culture Connect um, channel. Uh, so I, d I did the first one, it was like a 101 to meet them, uh, and then Catherine Croft, who's directed the London, um, paired with Mark Kruger, a local architect and urbanist, to talk firstly about the Court Centre and uh, the very controversial shopping centre. Claremont and then um, comparing that with Leeds University and also a now demolished shopping centre in Portsmouth and then last we focused on three buildings which I was going to touch on quickly which is an amazing artscape and we could spend that and then finish them off with the barbecue. Um, I think some people have not switched off their mics uh, um, so, uh, Albert, um, he's going to run through, he's got 56 slides. Um, please comment. Sonette Tatch is very kindly going to be monitoring those. And um, we hope to have time just before two to have comments and, and questions. So, Albert, over to you for your conversation. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so the title of this talk is Apartheid, Brutalism and Blue Jeans. And uh, the talk was first given in um, uh, for Stellenbosch University for a colloquium. Um, now, uh, around about 2015 and 2016, there was lots of student protests in South Africa with the um, uh, first the roads must fall movement. Um, and a lot of these movements do, demanded the removal of um, uh, sculptures and um, buildings, things that would remind them of the past. Hmm. So uh, if you could just move to the next slide, Kate. Sure. So the uh, open Stellenbosch movement and Stellenbosch uh, w was a similar movement. They were more sort of focusing on, on the language policy of, of Stellenbosch. Um, but they also wanted a more free, open curriculum. And, and it's Open Cell and Bosch that um, made the claim that the ghosts of apartheid was living inside this, this um, uh, university um, and in its buildings specifically. 
So um, the celebrated modernist architect Le Corbusier and his book Towards a New Architecture cried architecture of, or revolution. And for him, it was really that architecture is necessary uh, means to, to uh, and has the power to radically transform people's lives. So if you can go on to the next slide, Kate. So um, the uh, Stellenbosch uh, Music Department um, commissioned me to do this talk as a colloquium, a lunchtime talk. Um, and they wanted me to investigate where these ghosts are. Um, is it in, these, in, in their building? Um, and you can see an image there in the background of the Stellenbosch Conservatorium building. Okay, we, we, we can move on to the next slide. So um, one of the first uh, brutalist buildings or uh, uh, first uh, uh, was probably Le Corbusier's Unité de Habitation. And it was him that first sort of used the words beton brew. And if we can move on to the uh, next slide. Um, so um, uh, modernism was a style that dominated the 20th century. And brutalism is actually just a term for buildings of, that are part of this late modernist tradition. So often brutalism is um, uh, 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 often some modernist buildings that don't necessarily have offshoot concrete or very rough concrete skins are, are, are still a termed brutalist and that's more to do with their formal and abstract qualities. So on, the, on that slide, you can see there was a whole uh, series of brutalist buildings, um, including, for example, the Sydney Opera House on the top right-hand side, which is a lot softer structure, but it still has this sort of um, heavy concrete base. Um, and then you, you'll have brutalist buildings uh, from sort of 1960 all the way through to about 1985. Okay, and move on to the next slide. So the person who first used, or, or, who, or the architectural critic who then took on these, the, uh, Le Corbusier's term, Le uh, uh, Beton Brutus, Rainer Banham. And he actually got that popular term from a visit to um, Sweden um, with some, some of his friends there. And, and, and because he was an architectural critic, he started using um, this book and he, uh, using this uh, uh, word brutalism and you can see it here in the title of this book So we can move on. Yeah um, So in the context of the period in the late 1960s and fashion and popular culture from outside South Africa was for the first time being taken seriously by by, by the state um, and rock and pop music were for the first time being given um, airtime on radio um, and it was during the 1968 Paris riots um, that blue jeans and pop music became associated with a counter-cultural revolutionary movement, student movements. Um, and it was in this climate uh, of, um, of the birth of post-modernity that uh, brutalism was coming, uh, was, was falling and coming to an end. Um, um, so together with the introduction of post, uh, uh, in the late 1980s, the apartheid state and the Soviet Union were on their knees and uh, blue jeans, pop music and capitalism um, was not only conquered by the, con by the apartheid state, but the personal belief and personal freedom um, gave private capital and corporations the power to influence the general public with uh, via media, advertising and marketing. Um, and it was uh, the architectural critic, Jonathan Myers, um, uh, that's a, a quote from him that says that even though uh, pop music in the middle 60s um, shows an absence of affili affiliation with the architecture, there was a, really a generation gap between these new countercultural young set and, and the, the old guard that were seen as part of the establishment. Um, as part of a kind of uh, brutalism was seen as an establishment driven architecture, part of welfareism, institutions and state hospitals. And in South Africa, this connection to the state is why brutalism became um, associated with apartheid. So um, in, this stuff, in the context of, this, of, 
of these sort of Afrikaans university departments, um, a, a, a attempts were made to divert attention away from apartheid and uh, with a new outward focus on technology. But they thought that if they would fo focus on science and technology, that it would um, divert attention away from, from any kind of political um, uh, statements. So brutalism was seen as a means to, for those institutions to move a, away and, uh, 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 from, from state, in, state power. Okay. Next, next slide. So um, at Stellenbosch itself, and uh, prior to the construction of the conservatorium, um, the, the, the most of the buildings were designed by a single architect who was a, a part of a, um, a, 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 a exclusive, a, 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 a secret organization called the Afrikaner Bruderbond. And it was an, sort of an exclusively white male organization um, uh, that uh, included many prominent figures from the South African political life. And Collins was one of these right-wing architects uh, or one of these architects that were part of this movement. And he got, um, and he was allowed, or he, well, he got the commission to do all of these buildings that you see on the left-hand side of the divide uh, from uh, the Wilcox building, the Van der Ster building, the Cecil Year, the DF Milan building. And then, um, it's interesting that these buildings that come out of a conservative nas nationalist enterprise, they were pro-national party, which was the main party um, that was in control during the apartheid years, are very similar to international examples in dictatorships. And as you would see on the right-hand side, you'll see the Portuguese Estado Novo buildings from the University of Coimbra. And you'll see that there's a, a lot of similarities between these buildings. And um, we'll look a bit closer on that. Can you go to the next slide, Kate? So the director of the conservatorium um, uh, was uh, determined to, to kind of break with the conservative administration of the University of Stellenbosch. And um, he... Uh, uh, in the in the late 50s, he befriended Gilbert Cullain, who who would like to, like to become the architect of the conservatorium. And um, during this meeting, he got excited about the brand new vision that would move away from the old conservatorium building that you see on the left hand side, and part of the away from the old god, and sort of would initiate um, South Africa's um, uh, accept or could help with South Africa's reacceptance into into the international. Um, uh, uh, a music, uh, a classical music scene. Um, so uh, he, he met with Colain, and uh, by the 1970s, Colain's practice uh, was already uh, established, well established, and he'd finished buildings such as the Trust, Trust Bank, which is now the APSA building in, in Cape Town, and also one in Johannesburg. Um, and he He's, he received an award for his own house in Higovale in Cape Town. And these accolades help cement the, 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 the practices um, um, uh, appointment. Also at that stage, the university itself appointed uh, Kulain and Meiring the practice to do the master plan for the whole of Stellenbosch. We can move on to the next slide. So uh, pre-war modernism is uh, really a kind of a... A, 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 a kind of a style chameleon, chameleon or a, a political chameleon. It's, it was straddling both right-wing nationalism and, it, and its opposite, which is left-wing collectivism. So they were both, both this right-wing and left-wing were utopian in, in nature. And um, they, um, uh, and central to the sort of allegiance to the cult of, it, of modernity, they both wanted an allegiance with technology and science. Um, and the, for many of the left-wing collectivist architects, they were more concerned with a kind of communist and socialist values of, to do with health and the plight of the worker. We can move on to the next slide. So there's lots of sanatoriums. You can see the sanatoriums there. So uh, the left-wing art, architect, Adolf Lewis, and you can see here a picture of Alamula, is, is often misunderstood for, a, for one of his um, uh, decrees. And he used to say, ornament is crime. 
Um, uh, and people misunderstood that as a kind of call for abstraction and minimalism. But instead, Lewis was actually not concerned with necessarily with, uh, with abstraction and min minimalism, but he was um, concerned with the remunera remuneration of the, of the skilled workers who produced all of those fine details that we saw in buildings in the 19th century. So for him, modernism and, and later brutalism would signify sort of move towards the workers, towards uh, uh, away from asceticism. I can go to the next slide. So on the, on the other hand, uh, uh, in the opposite direction of, of Lewis and the, the left-wing architects, you have on the right wing, you have, right wing, you have Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, German, and early Afrikaner nationalist architects. Um, who, who uh, were kind of, uh, what can put it in inverted commas, progressive, progressive fascists and included futurist art, artists and architects. And for them, technology was um, uh, needed for, for the purpose of national salvation. Um, and uh, what suited them in modernism was its iconoclasm, because that iconoclasm would would um, signify a kind of moral sacrifice for state and country. So the Afrikaner National Party architects from that period were slow on the uptake and they were still uh, taking um, inspiration from pre-World War, um, uh, Second World War, North European traditions. You can go to the next slide. So you'll see that there's the Volkschlager Denkmal on the left-hand picture and the Fuhr Tracker Monument on the right-hand side. So these early Afrikaner architects were taking inspiration from, uh, from this, these sort of early monumental uh, buildings and uh, buildings like the Huguenot Monument in Franz Hoek um, and uh, as well as this Fuhr Tracker Monument are really about kind of funerary rituals and myth-making. Um, and uh, in effect, their architecture gave birth to the dark side of modernity. Um, and the John, John Collins faculty buildings in Stellenbosch prior to, to, to 1970 can be sort of seen as watered down, polite versions of, of, of this kind of architecture. Um, so here we can see one of Christian Liebenberg's uh, slides of the uh, buildings that came after that followed in that tradition of the of those early monuments, but at this stage following this Jan van Weyck, the architect, 1975, and it's the um, the Afrikaans language monument. Um, but there were other monuments that were built in the late 60s and and in the early 70s that that were also made out of concrete that also followed this brutalist tradition that were also concerned with Afrikaner nationalism. And you can see there on the left-hand side the um, Fuhr Trekker monument, monument in Vinberg in, uh, in the northern Free State, and the, uh, the Bergen Dahl monument uh, in, in Makazeni, which is right next to it, and then, of course, the African... Uh, so this shows that there was a continuity into brutalism from that, from that uh, right-wing tradition. So if we can move forward. Okay. So, um, so both right and left wing modernists were obsessed with sanitation and the upliftment of the worker. Um, and in effect, they be believed that the, 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 the state, apartheid state, um, bought into the idea that this modernist separation of functions could be used um, to reorganize its citizens by race through legislation such as the Slum Clearance Act of 1930. Of the, before and the Group Areas Act of 1950. Um, and the most infamous example of forced evictions occurred in District 6 in Cape Town from 1968 onwards, when 60,000 people were moved to modernist housing blocks on the Cape Flats, about 25 kilometers away. You can see the picture there on the bottom right-hand side. Um, and it was during the 1970s and early 80s that Kulain and Meiring, the same architects that were employed by Stellenbosch University to do their master plan and to do the buildings in Stellenbosch, um, uh, uh, the, the conservatorium building, was, was given the, the uh, commission to design the new Cape Technicon. And you can see there on the right-hand side, it's also kind of a brutalist megastructure. 
um, and it, uh, and uh, it was quite contentious at the time because most architects refused to work in the District 6 area, area during apartheid. Um, and, um, um, and this sort of signified that connection with brutalism. So, um, so modernism um, really built uh, 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 wanted to separate uh, 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 functions in the city. And you'll see there in the top right hand picture, this divisions, there was these areas of no man's land called slope, space left over after planning. The sort of green belts um, and railway lines to divide communities of different colors, uh, of uh, different races. Um, uh, we can probably move on to the next slide. So the first time modernism was sort of introduced to South Africa was by Rex Martinson, and he really did that in the building of his own house. So you can see this is House Greenside in Johannesburg. Um, and it's amazing to think that this House Greenside was built two years prior to the Voortrekker Monument, the building that looks so similar to the Volkschlager Denkmal. And that really gives you an idea of how, how, culturally how divided this right and left left-wing movements were in, the, in, in those, those days. Um, so we can probably, uh, so, so it, it was during the time of uh, Rex Martinson that, that, that uh, Mart uh, Le Corbusier made Martinson part of the Congress International de Architecture Moderne. You can see one of their posters there, there on the upper left-hand side. And um, many anti-establishment left-wing politic uh, uh, left-wing modernist architects who fled in the wake of World War II were employed in the USA by universities in the state. And this meant that the left-wing anti-establishment art and architecture of the pre-war avant-garde became de-radicalized and institu institutionalized. And as a result, this modernist architecture was rebranded as the international style. And um, uh, ironically, in the Soviet Union, in the beginning, they were still building these kind of wedding. Um, but you had uh, the pre-war modernist architects who had fled to the United States, who started building modernist buildings, as you can see in the Lakeshore departments. And these buildings are from the same period, and you can see the difference between the two. Um, the th modernism also really offered, it, it, it kind of became marketed and, and became the, uh, 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 to symbolize kind of corporate power. So to this day, you'll find many corporate headquarters built in the modernist style, very simple glass uh, skyscrapers. So Mies van der Rohe um, revolutionized, uh, revolutionized building construction by using steel. And you can see here in the top that, um, uh, there's two buildings, the Trust Bank building in Cape Town, which is on the left-hand side, now the APSA building, and the other Trust Bank building, which is in Johannesburg. And uh, they are almost, uh, they're very similar to, not, not quite identical, but very similar to the Seagram building in New York by Mies van der Rohe. Um, uh, and, and, you know, this, this sort of new steel architecture allowed for taller buildings and, and allowed for large open space uh, spaces and um, also for, 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 for modular types of construction. So we can probably move on to the next slide. So if you look at the conservatorium's um, entrance foyer with the steps up to kind of the raised foyer, it's actually very similar to Mies van der Rohe's um, Crown Hall, which is on the right hand side. Two buildings, um, and also similar to, to to, the, to Ms. van der Rohe, um, the Colleen and Meiring also did the master plan for the university, uh, university as, as Ms. van der Rohe did his master plan for the Illinois Institute of Technology. You can see there on the bottom left hand side. And, and this, the, their master plan is still in, in, in place today, Colleen and Meiring's at Stellenbosch. So you can go on to the next slide. So you can see very clearly if you look at the plan of the conservatorium building, it's kind of, um, it's very similar to the sort of Bauhaus architecture of uh, pre-war architecture. And you can see 
this kind of pinwheel effect in the plant so that uh, it's got separate wings that's uh, that sort of pin around the uh, 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 form a kind of a pinwheel shape and then you can see if you look at the conservatorium buildings uh, Kulain very cleverly because it was a music department divided the practice wing Oh, but we can't hear Italy. you. This would separate, the so move on to the slide. If you can move on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, what from the master plan uh, in Kulain and Mayring was adopted? So the idea was, was that um, he would create these negative spaces. A negative space just means that the space is open. There's no volume, building volume in it. In order to make this nice forecourt that you can see there at the top image, and, and that forecourt was, the, was part of the master plan for the university to create a kind of public space that would join the conservatorium to the rest of the university. And similarly, there was a, another pub, a negative space at the rear that was f to be used for um, a music, impromptu music performances on the, on the rear lawn. Okay, we can move on to the next slide, Kate. So here you can see um, the uh, different parts of the building uh, and I've tried to kind of pinwheel it around as well. So you can see each portion of the building um, um, a views from, from it according to, its, uh, to, to where it's roughly located. Um, so you've got the raised foyer in the front and then you've got the department entrance and then these really cool 70s student waiting areas, sort of countersunk, um, um, uh, uh, features uh, where the students could gather before they go in for their lessons. Um, and uh, it's interesting to note that the building was supposed to be off shutter con a co concrete or had a concrete finish, a rough concrete finish, um, uh, but the local council refused because they, they said that Stellenbosch was a white plaster architecture. And so, so they kind of compromised because Kulain in the end used a, a kind of a slight pebble dashy, a pebble dashed terrazzo type finish on, which is rough, but it's white. Um, so hence the, the kind of white appearance of the building. And he cleverly wanted to reduce the scale of the building by, um, you see the copper roof above, uh, which is in a darker color so that you'll just get this idea of this floating foyer. So the foyer sort of floats over the, um, uh, over the base of the building. And, and then with these steps up, very similar to the Crown Hall building um, of Ms. Van der Rohe that we saw before. We can go to the next slide. So um, in South Africa, the sort of brutalism was ushered in by the, um, uh, really with, uh, with high profile um, national arts buildings. Um, and of this, the, probably the most famous is the, um, uh, uh, which is today Artscape. And it opened in 1971 um, and it was uh, racially segregated. Uh, um, and it was named after Nico Milan, who was a politician and administrator of the Cape at that stage. Um, and the Artscape and the Conservatorium are products of a similar era and exude similar design traits. They, they both have this positive negative space, this open public space to the corner. It's very similar to the, to the Conservatorium building. I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And there's some, uh, this, uh, a picture of this, uh, again, the raised foyer where you come up with steps and, um, and there's kind of a, a concrete exterior shell with these fin-like sh shapes. Okay, we can continue. Kate, you can keep going. So this sort of interior was, is, is really one of the best examples of modernist interiors in worldwide. It's, it's got beautiful bronze details and incredible Murano glass chandeliers and tapestries. Um, and uh, it's really one of the best 20th century examples of, of, a, of a fine brutalist interior. And go to the next slide. So um, the, um, 
it's it was quite unfortunate that this building was kind of tainted with 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 apartheid and brutalism uh, uh, or brutalism was attained therefore tainted with the uh, uh, apartheid and and as a result the uh, the uh, the theater has employed gap architects to come up with a kind of architectural facelift and um, you'll see there below an image of gaps proposal for the artscape um, but this this facelift was not well received by architectural preservationists um, and uh, and and they uh, it, it was not uh, i don't think uh, 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 well received so you can also see there the 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 state theater in pretoria a very very br uh, even more brutalist building so it just shows that these these theater buildings and public institutions were all constructed in the similar style, very tectonic. So it shows how the different parts, uh, the beams and the floor plates and things are connected together, expressed. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So this is the, the Baxter Theater Center. It was designed by uh, Jack Barnett. Now, Jack was probably the Albert, we can't hear you. Albert, we, we can't hear you. Okay. Okay. Back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now it's fine. Okay, okay. So, so Jack Judah Barnett was, he was Jewish and um, he was a, uh, uh, imprisoned in, for two months uh, during the Sharpeville uh, massacre, uh, massacres and, and he's, he also adopted this brutalist style. So, so there was, a, there is really a, a, a case to be made to say that during this period, um, these architects were using this style to signify moving away from apartheid. Um, and you'll see that beautiful concrete ring beam in, in the main con one of the concert halls, the theater hall uh, at the top. And was this sort of, it was UCT's version of the conservatorium was there and the, the building sort of tears down with a natural slope and then this huge mega structure roof with these orange domes um, around over the, that, that spans over the foyer. Um, um, beautiful column free structure. Uh, and again, brutalism here is not necessarily um, a, uh, 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 use of concrete. He, he used an, a very rough brick that almost like elephant skin like texture um, to signify this kind of textured heavy surface. You can see it better in that black and white image on the bottom right hand side. Um, and how that sort of textured surface uh, uh, would, would appear. So it's still very brutalist in its, in its approach. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. So um, at uh, roughly the same period in the construction of the conservatorium, Kulain and Meiring, uh, the, the, the Gilbert Kulain, the architect of the conservatorium, were also employed to oversee the construction of the Good Hope Center in Cape Town CBD. Um, and this was designed by the renowned Italian modernist architect, Luigi Nervi. Um, and um, it was the largest single span structure um, upon its completion in 1977. And they really learned from the mistakes of Artscape or the uh, Nico Milan Theatre because they realized that they needed to create an open, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 open access for everyone. Everyone was invited. There was no racial, racial segregation for the opening of the structure. And similarly, also not for the conservatorium. We can go to the next slide. So here's some other examples of architects working in the period. Um, and I think probably the most significant is, is probably Tony and Adel dos Santos, who, um, and Adel dos no, Santos um, served as the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planet, Planning at MIT for years. And she also designed the Library of Congress uh, uh, in, um, in uh, Washington. Um, so she moved from South Africa to to the United States, and you can see some of 
uh, uh, the building's house. Steckhoven, which is on Lane, 1972 in Kenilworth, and the Scott Road Apartments with this big concrete brisole. It's very brutalist um, uh, buildings, uh, um, but wonderful free form and uh, with promenade like spaces that you can move through, lots of ramps. Um, and then you've got Harvey Fagan, who who also used concrete, but he was already moved away from modernism. And um, I would really not even place him in, uh, in, in that. Same category, also contemporary, and we've already looked at uh, Rulof's um, buildings in the previous talk, so I won't go into too much detail, but he was teaching at the University of Cape Town and was famous for his Wertmüller Center. He's standing there by the model of the Wertmüller Center on the top right hand side of the picture. Okay. So, um, Le Corbusier's La Tourette Monastery um, gives us some insight to the expression of music in brutalism. And it's uh, thanks to Janis Zanakis, who was a 12 tone composer working in Le Corbusier's office. Um, he wanted to give this brutalist or modernist architecture sound. And uh, whilst designing the window mullions and, and the way that the light would w come in into the cloister, um, and, and, and that represented a music score um, that could literally be played. And you can go online and you can listen to this music score today. Very interesting. If we can move to the next slide. So similarly to, to that um, uh, 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 building by Le Corbusier, the La Tourette, you have also Gilbert Collain trying to kind of imagine the music in his acoustic attenuation. It's very playful on the wall. Can you see there on the, back, on the wall of that auditorium? Um, uh, and it's sort of like a giant piece of origami. Um, um, and, and very, uh, 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 very fine interior, very well integrated uh, with the uh, doors and furniture and things around it. So it's just these abstract surfaces. You can see it also in the Fismal Hall. And we can go on to the next slide, okay? And the next slide. So um, the local architect, Stefan Antony, actually acquired one of Gilbert Collane's um, uh, Ego Vale in, in uh, Invermark Crescent. And um, it really gives us a, a good indication of what these buildings could look like if they're well restored, if they're well looked after. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and you can really see that this house um, uh, is almost like a machine for living in. It has these um, very, very thin columns and then thin plaster board wall, uh, partitions. You can move to the next slide. And it's really, a, I wouldn't say it's brutalist, I'd rather, uh, but it has brutalist elements as you can see in the concrete, these concrete panels. Um, and what makes these brutalist buildings so easy to, to, to work with in a way is the fact that they have these loose panels. So one can easily, if you, as long as you work within the language, the stylistic language of it, you can easily move these modular partitions around inside the module of the building. All right, can move to the next slide. So you can see how different the building was prior to Stefan Antony acquiring the building. So in the, during the uh, sort of late 70s and the 80s and 90s, um, there were all sorts of uh, um, um, all sorts of spaces and things added to the building. Um, but uh, 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 what Stefan did was just to bring it back within that modernist language. So it, um, and you could see on the on the on the previous slide the pool. So f it's it's interesting that for Hil Gilbert Collane was a real um, a modernist or functionalist. For him, the pool was a purely functional thing. It was for him to be able to go from his bedroom 
and get game pool. So pool wasn't necessarily viewed as a design feature. It wasn't integrated in the design. It looks almost alien to the rest of the building, if you can see in that bottom left-hand image. And if you go to the next image, here Stefan Antony reimagines that pool to the front. And it's a completely different, and actually, if I would say, in, in, in this instance, um, because the pool is now, uh, you can look, look at the view across that pool um, um, to the city, uh, 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 and, and the pool becomes part of the, um, the landscaping and, and, and is integrated into the architectural language. Okay, let's go into the next slide. So you can see in these images uh, uh, quite a few interesting examples of modernist buildings in South Africa specifically. From the Civic Center to the Baxter Theater to the State Theater in Pretoria um, uh, and uh, uh, Rowan Lane and, 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 so, and so forth. So brutalist buildings seems to be back in vogue and then internationally many have been heritage listed and renovated and, um, and these buildings are be becoming um, valued despite their ideological content. Um, and I, I, I don't think that all buildings associated with apartheid should be, re should be retained uh, as a reminder of our painful past, but I believe that a few of them are worthy examples of, of kind of Afrikaner nationalist anti-colonial hegemony as an, as an example of that. And, um, uh, such a pres uh, 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 if we can go to the next slide, Kate. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so you can see here the Burger Center, uh, which is also designed by Hannes van der Merwe, the same architect who designed the the, um, uh, uh, the Artscape Theatre. And we can move to the next slide. And some more images. You'll see again these raised platforms, a lot of modernist and brutalist buildings have a lot of these kind of flyovers and, and, and raised walkways that you would have to ascend upon on, on, on wide stairs and with, okay, next slide. So um, here we can see another building by the same Ah, but we can't hear you. But we can read what you <laughs> we can read what's on your slide. Albert, you've gone silent. Albert, are you there? Sonette, can you hear me? Shall I take over? Um, hopefully, everything's okay, you can hear what I'm, I'm saying. Um, I just w wanted to give a taste of what's happening next week, same time, same place. And then the, the following week, we're a bit earlier at um, 9.30 in the morning because of the New Zealand time difference. Um, I'm thrilled that three of the editors of this book um, are going to be joining us for, for a conversation. Um, we're also going to be planning another series on architecture, going in reverse chronology and touching on a lot of what Albert's talked about, um, such as the modernism and then going through to Art Deco and then also Art Nouveau and even Victorian. Um, so can't wait to get back out and looking at all these buildings. Um, I hope you'll be able to join me, probably all wearing our masks and, and face shields. And please do let me know if you have ideas of where you'd like to go. And obviously we'll be um, including some of the buildings that Albert's mentioned. Or should we go to Sydney Opera House? <laughs> um, 
but mainly sticking in the Western Cape. So I hope next year to come to Houghton and go to Pretoria, particularly see the new museum Java Cup. Um, please do spread the word and um, give constructive feedback. Always like it. Um, if you think something in the shower tomorrow, please do email me and please do visit the Culture Connect shop. The masks are selling very well. Um, we're also doing books and you can see Paul, um, Paul Bank and Simon Hidden, Hidden Joburg um, in the bottom there. Uh, I'm just going to open up now to um, the floor. I'm not um, we've had problems with connectivity. I'm, I'm hoping you can all hear me. Um, I know some people have dropped off. Um, so